Good evening and welcome everyone to this, the inaugural Conversation Builds Understanding webinar series. My name's Bethan Griffiths. I'm a trustee for the National Heritage Ironwork Group and an ironwork designer and consultant through the Ironwork Studio. I'm your host for tonight. Joining me are our two panelists. Firstly, Rhys Brooks of Harrison Brooks Architects. Hello, Rhys. Good evening. And secondly, Jeff Wallace of Dorothea Restorations. Good evening, Jeff. Good evening, everybody. Tonight's topic for discussion is tendering. It's a large subject and it's just one part of the overall process of procurement. So we only have a little less than an hour tonight to discuss this, so we'll try and keep on topic. And what we're specifically interested in is, is tendering up to a standard or down to a price? This is particularly in relation to craftsmanship. We're going to hopefully, uh, with your questions, explore how appropriate this is for master blacksmiths procuring them. The same issues obviously relate to all craftsmen. Rhys and Jeff represent different disciplines they work, that work together on the same project. However, while working together, their roles are therefore different and they have different perspectives. And it's this difference that we're interested in and uh, hopefully is what will provide the interesting insights tonight. Before we get going, however, I'd like to say a little bit about the National Heritage Ironwork Group or the NHIG for short. The NHIG was formed to address a lack of knowledge and understanding of heritage ironwork. This is important as ironwork is often outside and exposed to the weather. Not only that, it's also often functional ironwork. So the function needs to be remained, be it a gate, railings, a balustrade. It therefore frequently comes up for maintenance and repairs. The NHIG promote conservation, best practice and high standards of workmanship. And we do this to try and avoid um, inappropriate repairs. The NHIG is the volunteer run organisation providing information and guidance and co running courses like this webinar. Tonight, this event though is a joint venture between the NHIG and the Institute of Conservation's Metals Group. Icon support is what has made this possible tonight. Um, what I'm going to do is give a short background to our panelists and then invite them to give a short presentation on the process of tendering from their point of view. And I trust that will give us an understanding of their individual perspectives. So first up is Rhys. Rhys is a specialist conservation architect who has worked on historic buildings and landscapes for over 30 years. His most informative years were working with a pioneering timber framing company. Here, his role was to bridge the divide between the design team's aspirations and the practical realities of actually doing the job. The realization that quality of materials and skill of individual craftsmen have as much impact on the outcome of the project as the design has resulted in him adopting a collaborative approach ever since. Hi, Rhys, if you would uh, like to give us your presentation now. Thank you, Bethan. That's a um, perfect introduction. Um, so my, um, my approach today is to explain to you how an architect deals with tendering and why we have to tender and the problems it causes us. Um, as Bethan introduced me um, and mentioned, um, my formative experience really into tendering was um, when I was actually acting as a consultant in Carbon Road Woodland, working at the interface between people sending in documentations for tendering and actually looking at the product they're actually after. And the two are completely and utterly different. So there was a probably 90% of what came in through the door was pretty much useless and went in the bin because it was just irrelevant. And that ever since has um, fueled a passion for me to try and understand why there is this major disconnect between the design team and actually the people delivering the end product. It's complicated. Um, and I think one of the things that is um, the primary reason is that architects are taught usually um, over a period of seven to 10 years to deal with modern materials. And the process of, of building uh, a building is a very constructive, obviously additive process. 
which requires us to um, do a lot of research into materials, um, work out how they work. But ultimately, I suppose in the 20th century, we're really choosing products. Um, we're not actually looking at um, craftspeople. Um, gone are the days where we used to say, build a wall and just leave it to a craftsman to get on with, and we'd know the outcome. Nowadays, it's much more product-led um, process. So in essence, we're sort of choosing products over people. And that is a real problem, especially when you hit a historic building, because of course, the products don't exist in historic buildings. You're always dealing with actual materials and, um, and processes that have brought those materials about, and also decay processes, etc. So it's much more complicated. Um, so why do we run into this problem? I've often been very curious as to how to solve it. I mean, the problem is that most of the historic buildings that we deal with, uh, or the vast majority, I should say, are in the public domain, and therefore um, we have to be accountable for finances. All architects will tell you, or they should do anyway, what they're trying to do is achieve the best quality, the best value in the best time. Now, those things aren't necessarily mutually exclusive because you can you can certainly, um, you know, to, to get the really good quality, you have to generally spend a lot more money and spend a lot more time on something. So it's trying to get that balance. And we're always trying to juggle that. However, unfortunately, the tendering process for better or for worse, because we're dealing with public money, is all about trying to actually keep the costs under control. Very rarely are we in a situation where the contractor uh, or us as the architects are told that uh, money isn't a matter of concern. It's always a matter of concern. Um, and that gives us all kinds of issues which we're having to deal with on a daily basis. I guess the other issue that we're having to um, confront on a daily basis is the, with tendering is that if we're having to go out to say four tenderers we're usually having to go to a main contractor and if, if we're dealing with metal work or something like that we can't usually name the, the person that we want to actually tender to because the contracts that, that have been set up won't allow us to directly approach somebody so we're in a situation where we may be tendering to four main contractors and they may be tendering to four subcontractors so very quickly, we're confronted with 16 different potential subcontractors who we don't really know, all who have different skill sets. And somehow we have to decide uh, as to who's best to do the job. But we don't get that decision because the decision gets made on the main contract usually, which is often the bulk of the work. Not always the case, but usually the case. So we realize very early on that actually at the end of the day it's the person at the end of the trowel or the end of a hammer who makes the biggest difference and it's it's often very very difficult for us to bridge the gap between writing the specification and setting out the quality of what we're trying to get and actually speaking to the person who's actually doing work and even then if we do there's no guarantee that that person um uh, it's very difficult for us to evaluate the quality of those different people because there is no system for evaluation of the quality between you know, two different blacksmiths. You know, we may come from two completely different routes into blacksmithing, and one may be an artist blacksmith and very interested in certain things. Another one may be fantastic at repoussé work. Somebody may be fantastic at scroll work, you know, but maybe not so good at other things. So trying to get a level playing field, even if you've got the right people, is not always very easy. And that is a big problem. And I think that's where we struggle massively because however good we are in terms of designing something which isn't always the case obviously because lots of designs are ignorant because we don't know the materials you know we're having to deal with hundreds of different materials we don't always know the materials the subtleties of it and then we have this added confusion of people actually changing the mix so therein lies the problem how do we actually get from what we really want in terms of quality and actually get to the right people to deliver that quality through the main contractor. Uh, I've often heard it described as a friend of mine said, it's a little bit, um, being a subcontractor, a little bit like being in a trailer, being dragged behind a car, shouting instructions to the driver. It's just, you know, nigh and impossible. You know they're going wrong, but you can't actually steer them in the right direction. And um, I think hopefully as of tonight, we'll actually come up with some solutions. I've actually managed to solve it in some ways, but you can't always solve it. Um, and hopefully through the discussions with Jeff tonight, we'll actually come up with um, at least some pointers 
um, or points of discussion which we can take further, examine even more. Okay. Thank you, Rhys. Thank you. That was uh, very good. Now, Jeff, um, if you remember your mic you have, um, it's over to you. Um, I'll just give you a little bit of background on Jeff first. Uh, Jeff is a consultant specialising in historic metalwork and machinery. His vast experience comes from his previous position as managing director of Dorothea Restoration Engineers, for whom he was one of the founders. For over 30 years, he managed complex engineering and metalwork restoration contracts valued at 1 million plus on sites throughout the UK. In this role, he learned how to cope with not only the complexities of restoration work on sites, but also sometimes hostile contractual practices. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks very much, Bethan, and uh, good evening again to everybody. Um, thanks for the introduction. Um, as you can um, understand from Bethan's uh, words there, I'm very much a practitioner, I think as a contractor, and I've uh, only survived uh, for three decades in uh, the contracting industry by being fairly hard-headed. Uh, so I'm hoping to be able to put the contractor's view here. Uh, and if I could, I'd like to start by setting a little bit of context uh, which is uh, building on what Reese has said, actually. So I'm hoping you can see this as a, um, a shared. Okay, that, I hope that's coming through for you now. Um, as Reese was saying, um, much of the procurement in, of um, the work that we're involved with um, comes from an industry that is basically used uh, sort of designed as developed really for uh, sourcing new products that is products not services so if you go out into um, the world and want to buy a car or a washing machine or a component of some sort it's probably built to a standard uh, you've got a lot of choice it'll be accurately priced and it's easy to select and specify uh, on the other hand if you want to buy services uh, you may find that those products that you were going to buy perhaps if they were uh, electrical or plumbing equipment you wouldn't be able to use them yourself you would have to buy specialist services but they're using new materials so again those specialist um, contractors are probably working to codes of practice especially if they're uh, health and safety related critical trades uh, they will be regulated, probably accredited, and maybe certified, and there's quite a lot of them to choose from. Now moving into uh, towards conservation work, uh, you might, for example, be buying products there, like replica castings, for example, and you'll still be able to specify those. And if you can't, you may be able to just get some uh, samples made and then uh, use those as bench for benchmarking later. However, as you start moving into restoration services, you're providing a service, a specialist service, a very specialist service, and you're using old materials. They might be variable. They might well have original material defects in them. Uh, you don't really know what the original design duty uh, was that they were expected to perform, probably. Uh, the condition that you're receiving them in is probably unknown. You don't know whether you've got incipient cracks inside castings and things like that. The components or structures themselves may be very complicated. And therefore, it's difficult for anyone uh, to specify the work that needs to be done to them. There are virtually no codes of practice to do that specification to. The contractors who are going to be uh, competing in the tendering uh, are probably unregulated, and there's not, there isn't all that many of them. And the photographs you can see there are real life uh, Project, projects where, um, well, in the case of the one top right there, the, um, it literally did fall off a lorry and the instruction, and not our lorry, I should say, the client called us in and said, oh dear, it's broken, please fix it. And the one at the bottom is uh, wrought iron and that was the condition of the gate that the contractor got it in. So just to round off, uh, restoration is quite risky for the contractor. And what I really need is clear instructions and a low risk working environment. Uh, that is low risk from the point of view of the contractual uh, documentation. It's a legal contract document, a legal agreement. Uh, technically, it needs to be a low risk for me and the environment in which we're working in, uh, in which we're working. And so these are some of the risks that I'm going to have to 
uh, assess, probably price for, and then certainly manage during the course of the contract. I'll just read through those, if you would. I'm not going to go through all of them, uh, but you may not have thought of some of those. Uh, and by an ignorant architect there, I don't mean an architect who's uh, uh, ignorant in the disparaging sense, but simply doesn't understand the materials and the, uh, the risks that those materials bring uh, and the uncertainties that this whole um, environment brings. Overzealous quantities, quality, quantity surveyor, again, they may well not understand that we're running risks. And frankly, we may have been caught out. And if the quantity surveyor is not going to sort of recognize those, uh, we're into conflict immediately. Look right down at the bottom, client insolvency. It, there may be good reasons why the client can't afford to pay. Uh, and of course, we're a long way contractually from the client in many cases. So it's, it is quite risky. Uh, okay, uh, that's somewhat uh, depressing, I suppose. Uh, but I'm afraid that's a sort of uh, fact of life as, as to where we are. Uh, and where I would like to leave my introduction so that we can now start discussing that. And as, as Risa said, I hope we can come up with some, some sort of practical working solutions to these uh, lifelong problems. Thank, Thank you, you, Jeff. That was uh, very good. Okay, so as host, I'm going to be asking the questions. And so if you see me looking a little distracted, uh, please excuse me because I'm trying to find the next one and go from there. Right, um, so first one is actually an advanced question, um, but do you remember with the questions you put in, please do try to keep them on topic, you know, very specifically on tendering. Um, question is from Kate Jennings. How do you deal with a tendering situation in which you believe inappropriate materials or processes have been specified? And then she goes on actually, as a follow-up to this, if you have if you have advised alternative approaches and the client or main contractor continues to insist on what they believe are appropriate materials or processes, would you walk away or carry out the work as specified? <laughs> oh, so this is a toughie, isn't it? And it's all about the information you receive, the information a practitioner receives at the start of the project. So I don't know who wants to take a lead on that. Shall I start that? Because obviously it starts with us, <laughs> starts with the architects. Um, I think what people need to be aware of is several things. First of all, architects aren't trained to write specifications. I mean, I had 10 years of training and I think I had probably two hours of specification writing. You learn on the job. Um, and as a result, there is a, um, most modern buildings in particular are which geared towards obviously new constructions, um, use a process called the NBS, which is National Building Specification. Now this is just solely geared toward new buildings and it is basically a means of shopping and QSs will use this and I'm constantly getting reminders about, you know, have you signed up to the NBS? I've never used it. It's completely irrelevant and useless for conservation jobs, to be honest with you, um, because you have to get to know your product, you have to know the materials and you have to know it intimately. And I think what a lot of the problems I see, certainly when I was working in a contracting organization, was actually that people were reliant on a, on a pro forma specification, which didn't actually fit the bill at all. And it was completely gobbledygook. Um, and you know, for example, I can't imagine the uh, national building specification had anything to do with raw time. It'll tell you how to do what welds you need on you know, mild steel or on S275 steel or whatever it happens to be. Um, but it won't tell you anything about raw time and it won't tell you anything about repairing of cast iron, etc. So that leaves the specifier really fumbling around. That is assuming the architect is specifying it, of course, because normally it would be passed or um, certainly in bigger jobs, it gets passed over to the quantity sphere who has even less knowledge about historic buildings because they're basically accountants, to, to be honest with you. So therein lies the problem. You actually have got an imperfect system which is being um, used on a very difficult and precise project, and it just doesn't work. There's just no Okay, so Reese, taking on from there, that, that gives a very good um, explanation of how this situation may have occurred. Yeah. But what can Kate do once she's received this information which she believes is inappropriate? 
Well, there is a mechanism through the there is a mechanism through the contract, or there should be if if it's been run properly, where the the tenderers can actually write and say, you know, ask questions and say, we think this is inappropriate, or they can actually raise the issue. But from what she's saying, I think she's already done that and they've been ignored. If you are being ignored by the uh, main contractor, um, personally, well, I would walk away from the job, but, you know, because, you know, you've been asked to do something you feel, uh, I mean, for example, if I was an architect and I was told by the client, I, you have to do that because that's the way I want to do it. And I know it's fundamentally wrong. I would just say, well, sorry, go and get somebody else to do it because I'm just not prepared to to um, crucify my principles on the basis of your ignorance. So I think that's that's what I would do. But you, the thing is that what you tend to find is there's a terrible, terribly long chain of command. And quite often, uh, as architects, we often don't even get the questions from the subcontractors. They maybe you're asking really, really valid questions, and we just don't even know because it doesn't get passed to us by the main contractors. So we're in the dark. And if we <laughs> don't get told, um, then we can't improve. It's as simple as that. We can't say, oh, yes, of course, that's an issue. We could, we could solve that problem. Okay. Um, and actually, that, that was actually. Yeah, that was actually going to be my question is, you know, maybe going to the main contractor is the wrong person and you're saying, yes, it might need to go further up the command, but it's making sure you talk to the right person. The contract doesn't allow you to do that. That's the unfortunate thing. The contract allows okay. the contractors to go straight to the, I mean, some do occasionally, I'm sure that some do, I'm sure that Jeff and his, his booster has historically gone to the architect, but if you're tendering to a main contractor, you are responsible to your main contractor and that's where you send your responses normally so that it's an imperfect system it's a stupid system so, so what you're saying is you might through that system is you don't have a method of actually getting to the person that you actually need to speak to that's right so what we've done that's... what we've done is we actually write in our specifications actually we, we actually very clearly specify that if there if if you as a stonemason or a timber framer or a blacksmith no, a better way to do this, then please feel free to contact us. Now, that's slightly unusual protocol because normally you wouldn't do that on a big public funded job, but that's how we have, as architects, have actually gained our knowledge base because some guy may phone up and say, we did one of those three years ago and this is what, these are the issues we found. Um, so I think it is really difficult because you don't have the direct communication between the different people actually doing the work and people specifying the work uh, and I think therein lies a major problem but Jeff will tell me differently I'm sure Jeff. yes Jeff have you got anything to add I think you're, what you've said is exactly right Reese. Um, it's the long uh, communication chain that's the problem and as Sarah said in her introduction conversations build understanding and if you can't have that conversation at the tendering stage, uh, it doesn't bode well for subsequent delivery of the job. Uh, and so my first reaction, my first um, effort is to go back to perhaps the main contractor and say, uh, I'm not very happy about uh, this material and all the techniques that you've suggested. I would propose the following. And if they're prepared to welcome that, and some of them do, and send it in for approval, uh, to the architect or whatever, then I'm delighted. We're already into that conversation. Uh, of course, you've got to bear in mind that if I'm proposing something better, um, that is a bit of free advice that I'm giving to the client or the architect. And if that goes out to the other tenderers as an update on the tendering information or the answer to a query, all I've, all I've done so far is cut the feet from, under, uh, cut the, uh, feet from underneath me uh, by giving away my commercial advantage. So I, I need to try and understand how this whole process is going to work before I actually do feedback. Uh, and if I think it's a no hope situation where nobody's going to listen, it's going to be very contractual. There's a chain of um, legal eagles and uh, bean counters who are going to be principally running this contract. I would seriously think about walking away from it. Now, I can afford to say that after 20 or 30 years in business, because I've built up a business where I have other options. But for small contractors, and perhaps those who are newly in business, saying, oh, well, what the solution here is to walk away is a good way of going out of business. So it isn't actually a solution. And well, the best uh, 
advice that I can offer is to try communicating uh, and then try again if you really want to do the job. Uh, but be aware that you're paying for all this. And if it's just setting out, uh, if, it's, if it's looking as if you're going to get into uh, a, a problem, trying to communicate meaningfully at this early stage, then think seriously about walking away from it if you can. Okay, thank you, Jeff and Therese for that. And we have uh, our second question is also an advanced question that was submitted to us. And this is from Shona Johnson. And it's uh, quite similar in some ways. So the question is, we have on many occasions entered into dialogue with a potential client, often making site visits, discussing drawings, providing ideas and designs, and of course, costs. To then have, to then find, having done all of this groundwork, the job has to go to tender for financial reasons. Often using the material that we have provided as a basis for the tender documentation. At this stage, after so much time has already been invested and a good working relationship has been established, why should we bother tendering at all? Jeff wants to go. Go. Yep, that's a very good question. And uh, there's a very simple answer to it. I learned this a very long time ago. Uh, and that was when the, the client phones up uh, and says, um, we need you to come and um, help us do this. Uh, yes, we shall get you to do the job. It will be a negotiated contract and so on. Um, I say, well, um, I can offer you one of two services. I can offer you two services. You choose which one you want. Either I'm a consultant and I would like to come and uh, survey your structure and write the specification for you for a, a fixed sum. It'll be a modest sum, but you can have all my expertise for that sum. And then you can do with the documents as you wish. You can invite us to tender with them against them, or you can go to our tender whatever uh, to others. Um, or the second um, service I can offer you, if you have a specification uh, and some viable tender documents, please send them to me. And as a contractor, I'll price them. So if you get into the, the situation where you're being drawn into uh, providing free service more and more and more, I have to say uh, you've possibly left it too late. You need to see it coming and say at the outset, these are the two services I offer. Just one point of caution, though, if you are offering uh, advisory services, you should have professional indemnity insurance. And as a contractor, you might not. So just be aware of that. I completely agree. I mean, it's a very similar situation to, to, to us. I mean, obviously, people phone us up and say, can you come and look at our building? And you go along and they pump you for information and ideas. And so we've started to say, well, you know, we'll have look at your building, but you know, we, we may not want to work with you, you know, so it's a quid pro quo, you know, we'll come and look at it, see whether we enjoy working on the building. But, you know, it's a serious issue that Jeff's made. I mean, if you're going to go and look at something and spend time in it, you, are, you know, you need to be um, reimbursed for that time because, you know, somebody's actually taking your, you know, you gain the knowledge perhaps over 10 years and you can see something in five minutes that would take others weeks to see. So you've got an invested, um, you know, and a degree of investment in your knowledge. So just charge for it, I would, I mean, to be honest with you. And if they don't, if they don't want to, you know, if they don't want to pay your fee, um, then the reality is, you know, they're not going to be good clients because they're just going to take and take and take and take and, and then they're going to say, well, we're going to have to tender now and you, that, you'll end up in a situation you've ended up with. So I just, I just charge them. That's so me. I could just make one uh, further comment on that. Um, I used to turn this situation to my advantage by making available one day of my time free for any client who had a substantial job and a, uh, a genuine inquiry. And I would go and see them and talk to them, explain to them what services we could offer, how good we were at our work and all that sort of stuff, find out exactly what it was they needed and so forth, and then make the point that I can offer those two services. In other words, uh, you know, give something and then expect them to make a choice uh, from two uh, viable options, as it were. Yeah, that's exactly the same as us, Jeff. It's two hours. We say, look, here's two hours free. And at that point, you're actually wanting to assess the job yourself. And so you don't feel you, you don't feel you can charge going to see a job and then to realise it's a real basket case and you don't want to do it. So it's just, yeah, and you say, well, give me two hours of free advice or come and have a look at your building. 
but then we'll decide how to go from there. And, and you just don't give too much away unless you're being paid for it. Yep. Well, I think that's definitely um, sound advice. And I hope everyone has a good view sharing that. Right, I'm going to take a live question now, one from James. And it's, Reese. this is for you. It says, hello, Reese. Why don't architects more often stipulate specialist heritage subcontractors to be nominated by the lead contractor? I think you covered part of this earlier. But if you... That's a very good question. And, I, uh, and it frustrates me um, because basically um, there used to be a, a JCT contract which enabled you, which is basically lots of different contracts. And there used to be uh, an ability to actually um, nominate a particular person. Um, so, for example, I want James Bloggs to do X, Y, and Z. You know, so I could actually say this is who I want to be involved. Well, the client sometimes would say that, but those have become so legally complicated that now they've been disbanded. Basically, you don't get uh, nominations. You can get named contra contractors, which is slightly stranger because the two words don't sort of sound the, they sound the same. But named is where you can actually name, say, three contractors subcontractors that you think are of value uh, and are, are suitable for the job. Um, but it is all comes down to the contract, really. Um, and if you get the wrong choice of contract from day one, and don't forget, so quite often, um, subcontract may be a very small part of the project. So you have to choose. There's no perfect contract, the bottom line, is you choose the right contract that best fits the bulk of the work that you do. And sometimes that will preclude things such as um, uh, specialist subcontractors. But uh, there is another way of doing it, it's just do it in parallel. But of course, main contractors don't like that because they have no control over the subcontractors and timing. But uh, if it's a standalone item, you can quite easily do that. OK, I'm just going to take this opportunity to say that um, people might not be aware yet, but the next webinar is on procurement as a whole, which you know, we're obviously just talking about one part of that tonight, tendering. We are in the next webinar going to talk about how to find um, craftsmen. Next question is from Toby. How can we improve communications across disciplines? So I take it this is across uh, the team involved, different people involved. Pub. Go to the pub. That's, that's the best. <laughs> of course. Uh, well, I think I think it's a very sensible question. I mean. It, uh, what um, Sarah was saying initially was, was very interesting that she was a SPAB scholar. I hadn't realized that she was a SPAB scholar. But there are lots of forums, um, and lots of organizations where um, like minded people or from different walks of life who may have a passion about heraldry or whatever it happens to be, they'll all come together and they'll actually talk to each other. Like this webinar, in some ways, is a very similar situation. Um, so, but the, if you're talking about communication within a series of design teams uh, and, and a contractor, it, that is slightly more tricky because I think what you tend to find, it does, does come quite quickly polarised. It's almost a them and us. And it's one thing I hate about the contracting industry. It's a, almost a them and us sort of um, attitude, which I think is very poor. I personally, I mean, I don't know whether all architects do this. Well, I know they don't all do this because I, I know for a fact this isn't the case, but every time... I will go to a site if it's active once a week and I will spend my time talking to the people doing the work. Reason being is that I have to validate that work, make sure it's correct at the end of the day and I have to value it. Um, but also, I learn so much more from talking to the people that are on the tools doing the job than I would do reading a book. You can't get anything from reading a book, you know, to be honest with you, you can get, you can get background information, but you don't get the subtleties, you don't get the things which actually make the difference. Um, and that's the best way. So if a, so, when a if you see an architect on on site or an engineer or whatever, make the point of actually talking to them, saying this is why I'm doing this. You know, this is uh, what do you think? You know, because you know we want to, we want to be involved. <laughs> that's why we, that's why we got in the profession in the first place. We want to actually do the job properly and want to do it well. So uh, you will find some architects uh, who are just too busy or you know just can't confront it or whatever. But you know, generally speaking, I I would say that most people are really keen to learn um, and will actually spend the time of the day with you, especially if you explain something to them to save them from making another cock up in the future. 
What do you think, Jeff? Um, I agree with what you say, um, Reese. Uh, the worst experiences I've ever had is trying to communicate with um, architects or uh, specifiers or even uh, main contractors um, and to find that they're completely unresponsive and not willing to talk. And that's really frustrating. Uh, but I think you're right. We should be trying and um, hope that we have some success. I think what Toby had in mind was in the when you're in a contract, um, how best to um, promote communication. Uh, I want to just cite one experience I've had in 40, uh, 30 years of contracting uh, in which the contract was set up to be a partnering arrangement. Um, and there was a partnering workshop at the outset where all the parties forgot together, uh, the architect, the client, the main contractor, a whole raft of uh, subcontracts and so forth, uh, and went through the aims of the project. They talked about their own particular aims, like what do you actually want to get out of this project? Some said the next one, some said I would like to get a profit out of it. Well, they assumed that of everybody. The client says I want to sleep nicely at night. I don't want people phoning me up and complaining about noise and that sort of stuff. Uh, so we all understood where we were all coming from. Uh, the, it had to be an open book arrangement. In other words, everyone who was going to sign up to this partnering arrangement had to agree that everything was open book. In other words, all the financial details, and this is really uh, revolutionary, had to be visible on request to others. So I had to explain, if necessary, what margins I was making, where I was making a profit or a loss, and I could go and look at the con main contractor's books and saying, how much margin are you making on the whole thing? Uh, and this was actually a fixed price contract. In other words, we were all working to a budget, I think, of 1.4 million. Uh, and if we made a profit within that, in other words, if the total costs came to less than that, uh, the contract allowed for us to share the, the bonus, as it were, between us. Uh, now, it was administered by a main contractor, uh, and it proved to be quite hard work, but very successful. Uh, and it all relied on this open book and uh, a clear understanding of each other's motives and uh, justifiable aims. So that's utopia as far as I'm concerned. I've only ever had it happen once and it worked very well. So that's perhaps what we're aiming at. <laughs> Reese, uh, I don't know what I, you I, think I, of that. <laughs> yeah, Jeff, I agree. I've done, I've done a contract like that, which has ended up being about four and a half million pounds. Yeah. And it was completely open book. And actually, that was really, really useful because it was a similar sort of situation that there was a profit share. So what actually happened is people, you know, had to communicate and say, yeah. make things more efficient. And they were trying to help each other because at the end of the day, that it meant, up, meant that everyone got a little bit more profit. So yeah. you don't get the people being stroppy and, you know, not doing their job properly. And, and actually what was quite interesting with that, from my point of view, is there was a lot of self-condemning. So people <laughs> come and say, oh, that's not good enough, you know, which has made my job a lot easier. Not that they were condemning massively, but you know, they, they were really quite, because they were, they were looking out for each other a lot more. It's a much more collaborative approach. Well, I found it interesting. That, uh, for the first time in my career then, I found myself volunteering to make a slight reduction in my bill because others were doing the same, simply so we could pay the scaffolding contractor a bit more because he'd, he'd actually done a fantastic job and had underpriced the job. Well, that's not my problem, uh, but we, were, it, we turned out to be working somewhat like a family. We were sharing the profit and sharing the loss, and that's the difference. Uh, and it was a very satisfying process. And I just realized at the end of it, actually what we've just recreated here commercially was what we do in a family. That's very, very, very nice and good, good to hear. Um, I think that's probably answered enough. I'm going to move on to another question because the, the time is ticking. So I want to get a few more in. I have one more, which is, again, an advanced question this time by John Hill. Why don't main contractors only supply the relevant information to a specific trade, i.e. ironwork, rather than the overall project? It is discouraging to be in a position of information overload as if the main contractor is cost cutting at this stage, then how am I to trust him at the next when it comes to selecting craftsmanship over price? Well, they should. The reality is they should. I'm just going to share something if I can. So this will be like one of my specifications. Um, don't judge me, please. 
Uh, let me just see there. Share. Oh, can you see that? It's coming. Yeah, I can see that. So it's only part of the page, but I can see that's, it. That's that's content, and that just shows you this. These things in red should be sent to. This is how I do mine. This is what you send to the Metalwork subcontractor in this instance, because these are all the introduction stuff is all relevant. But then you go down. You don't need all this stuff about scaffolding or that stuff. You only need to know this element for materials and workmanship, and perhaps these things here, and that's it. And that's actually what should happen. So um, most of the time, it's just laziness on behalf of the main contractor. Bottom line, simple as that. And is that then true with the last comment there that, you know, he's feeling um, discouraged from information overload at that very first initial contact? I, I, I would. I would. You can't, if you can't distill relevance to you within 20 minutes, then, you know, you're wasting your time. And, and you know, I think I, I, I mean, it's a lot to do with the way that these things are packaged, to be honest with you, um, and written. So every specification and tender will be slightly different. But um, if there's only two, two components, say it's metalwork and stonework, say you're doing railings, let's say for argument's sake, then it should be really, really straightforward just to split the thing in half and say, look, here's the stonework and here's the metalwork. But um, main contractors often just uh, just can't be bothered. And in the digital digital world, it's just you know they just send over the whole lot. So you know, it seems mad. Jeff, I think you've got something yeah. to say, have you? There is a, um, a legal reason why they do this. Uh, if the contract, the main contractor has not provided you with information uh, that subsequently becomes relevant in the execution of the contract, um, then it's a problem for the main contractor because you, uh, you're deemed to have asked, uh, he is deemed to have supplied all the relevant information that you need and you price on what you know about. So if there's something he hasn't told you, and it's not, um, w as they say, within the consideration of the contractor when he's pricing, subsequently, he's got a claim on the main contractor. And that's why the contract, the main contractors send all the bumps so that they uh, can't subsequently be accused of having withheld uh, material information from their subcontractors for which they subsequently uh, get uh, into legal trouble for and get we get um, charged for in effect. That's only the point. I mean, normally you should get, I mean, that, that screen share that I showed, what, what I will send is all the contractual information, all the stuff which is legally binding, and then the schedule of works. You know, the, the metal worker doesn't need to know what drains you're re renewing. So I think you can be selective. You've got to, but you know, that's, that's, that's the job of the main contractor. He should know what is relevant to the subcontractor. And if he's not doing that, he's, then he's not, you know, he's, you know, he, he's, I mean, it's just late, uh, to, be, to be brutally honest, it is just laziness on behalf of the main contractor because it's easier just to send them everything and let the, the, the recipients actually sort through relevant stuff to them. And I think John makes a really good point, though, is it's discouraging when it comes to craftsmanship, because if they're looking at cost cutting here, you know, how do you know they're going for craftsmanship when they select the tender? But Reese, are you actually saying that it's down to the main contractor rather than how he receives the information from the architect? Well, well, well it depends on the, the route, but it, and also depends on the architect and the QS. So if, it, if it's like an MBS situation, which I dread to think how why it would be, but um, if it was a situation where you have a contract which is produced by QS, and what quite often they will do is they will pair off the bits which are relevant to individual specialists because you know especially in the days when they had to post things it just got very complicated just sending them everything um it does depend on if the specification is really awkwardly written and it's a very intertwined thing and there's things which actually you know have a knock-on effect like for example you're taking out you know um juggles or you know complicated metalwork inside stonework etc then of course it does make sense to send you the whole thing because then of course it makes sense for the metal worker to understand well hang on i can't take that out until they've lifted this 40 tons of masonry off the building or whatever it happens to be there are times when it, it's clearly intertwined but when i write I, mean, I can only speak for what i do but when i write specifications i do think about the individual trades and think of well you know, what do you need to know and what is going to affect the way that you do this job 
Um, and to be fair, I think probably a lot of architects do that. Um, certainly the more experienced ones and the ones that deal with conservation, because that's how they evolved, you know, because they, they're thinking literally on material by material basis. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next question because I'm quite anxious about the time. Uh, now. Well, we have a few to get through still. Um, this is another advanced question. Um, what do you think have generally been the key deciding factors in the tenders you have won? Um, I think she's thinking price, expertise, reputation, pre-existing relationships, advice or input uh, you may have uh, provided during these tender process. Anything else? So the, the key, the key decide, what do you think are the key deciding factors in the, the, the tender process? Uh, shall I answer that, uh, Bethan? Um, yes. I think it's all those things, uh, at least I hope it is, because that's what we aim at. Um, I have to say that, frankly, it's often price. Uh, and if, it's, if it is going to be just price, I try and find that out in advance. In other words, I try and ask what the, the selection criteria are. I don't often get told, but uh, sometimes I do. And then I can aim to fulfill those criteria. Maybe it's uh, actually value for money uh, and uh, perhaps uh, the ability to meet a very tight program. Uh, or having specialist skills, or having other skills to call on in-house if things go wrong. There's all sorts of issues in it. And I try and find out what the client really needs, or what the uh, main contractor really needs, and then uh, make it clear that we can uh, provide those. I just want to uh, make one point about value for money. It's very subjective. Uh, over the years that I've been tendering uh, for significant contracts, quite often I've found that actually the price uh, that we've put in when we've been successful has been the second to lowest. And I came eventually to um, try and aim to be second to lowest. In other words, the most credible, the best value, the best, the, the most credible offer, in other words, most uh, detail and um, as I say, what the client actually wants or needs uh, are not necessarily the lowest price. Often somebody comes in under us who's perhaps being very heroic or maybe suicidal, and I'd rather not compete with them. Can I just say, okay. if you've written the specification correctly and the schedule of the works well, I mean, we reckon on about a 5% difference between tenderers, generally speaking, and sometimes it's less than that. I had a job oh, a couple of years ago now, uh, which came in um, very, very tight. And when I actually did the tender analysis, you, you couldn't put a straw between them. It was, it was actually very, uh, very tight. And I think the reality is that you're not bound as the architect to take the lowest price. I mean, I think what we're after is that, is that uh, holy trinity of, of time, quality and cost. So we really want the best quality we can possibly get. Um, Fundamentally, that's really what's generating our, uh, you know, our businesses is, you know, doing a really good job. Um, uh, and it, that will come with the cost. And you sometimes just have to explain to a client, well, you know, these people have actually tended slightly higher, but actually they've understood the problems. They, they've, they've budgeted for the, all the issues, whereas the other people, they haven't. So, you know. Can I just bring another question into this? Because I think you're answering this. Well, this is from a live question from Comeback. Is it possible to use non-price criteria in tender? There are some works where these criteria has some percentage on rewarding the tender, such as quality of the team or result of previous works of the team. Yeah. And that- I'm sorry, Are you asking me to, re to I'm sorry, can you repeat that? I didn't understand the question. Is it possible to use non-price criteria in a tender? So basically, are, is the tender being judged on things apart from price, I think is what he said, which is, I, I was just wanting to bring that question in because it's a live question to what Reese was just saying, actually, because I think that is what you're saying, Reese, is that there are other judgments within this process. And if so, I think the question is really, what other judgments and weight do those judgments have? Well, here, herein lies the problem. Because if it's a subcontractor, you don't have access to that. If I was going to a contractor, let's say, let's say I was just going out to three blacksmiths, etc. Let's for argument's sake, um, I, there is a whole process prior to you. I'm not picking names out of the hat. There's all there's a prior process of, of if you like validation and going through 
knowing their work, we work with them before, and knowing what they can offer, you know, their communication skills, all of those things are factored in uh, to who you put on a list. So you're not going to put on somebody who's, you know, you know, is just never going to speak to you and just deliver the stuff to site because, you know, you know in your heart of hearts that there's potentially some design issues that you need to talk about, you know. So, so I think what happens is a lot of the, uh, you do factor in all those things at, at pre-tender stage and um but as an architect quite often this comes back to what we were saying about the ability to come back to the architect and raise questions so if so a contractor came back and asked a question which i thought oh my goodness of course i haven't thought, thought of that you know that would completely change the way i viewed something because they I would they would demonstrate to me that they'd understood a problem that i hadn't actually seen and that's really 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 vital because you know, no one's perfect. You know, the whole idea is there's two heads are better than one, and you know, getting somebody else's input is really invaluable. I don't know whether that answers the question, but I think it's okay. Important. We have actually reached what we thought was going to be our time limit, but there's about four more questions. So I think for those who would like to hang on, I think we should um, have a go at um, asking them. Yeah. Which can. Okay. So one is um, Dan. I have often been asked to tender for a job on which there is an unrealistic deadline, often inflexible due to being tied to funding availability. Any thoughts? Oh gosh, this, this... that's not easy, is it? <laughs> well, I, 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 you know, we we have the same problem. I mean, it's when you have sort of uh, annual budgets and you have silos where you have to expend a certain amount of money within a certain financial year. Then it clicks into the next financial year. It's it, you know it's it's just it's nightmare, and uh, I think we all suffer from that problem. Um, uh, and I, to be honest with you, I, I'm in probably in a slightly better position because as the architect, I've managed to manipulate things. Uh, so I had a job once with Natural England where I had to speak to them and say, look, you know, giving us a budget goes in. Some of it in the more in the first year than in the second year, and they're saying, no, 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 it's completely siloed. You have to do this some in the first year and this some in the second year, and it just made administering the job nine impossible. Um, so I, I sympathise, but to be honest with you, usually those funding things are related to government organisations, and you just you're beating your head against a brick wall. Okay, so there's no real. There's no. Answer. I mean, I try to overvalue stuff, but I can't legally overvalue stuff because you know. Uh, and I can't undervalue stuff. I, I've got to value what's actually done. So it, it, it is a, it is a nightmare. And I, and I, I, you know, it puts as many architects off, to be honest with you, as it does contractors. Okay. There's two, on, two, just briefly, there's two practical things you can do if you're tendering for a very tight deadline. One is to simply increase the price, knowing that you're gonna to have to work overtime and maybe put more people onto it. If you actually can meet the deadline reflected in the price, the second, uh, I have in the past, with very well-established clients that I know well, uh, agreed with them that we'll invoice ahead. In other words, raise an invoice ahead of the deadline, knowing that we're not going to certified for payment or actually paid until the work is completed, which may be after the deadline. But that doesn't work in all situations. Okay, but well, that's sound advice. Uh, another question running on is from Helen. Have you read the new BSI standard on conservation procurement? Have you, Jeff? Nope. <laughs> I mean, no, I think I, I mean, I've read the, the, the headlines to it, but I haven't actually read the nitty gritty bit. I mean, I think it's, um, it's one to watch, isn't it, really? That's okay. It. So we don't really have a, uh, we have an answer of a yes or no from that, which is really a no. Okay. Um, one, to, one to look into, though, for everybody. Yeah. Uh, next one is Will. What are the complications of getting professional indemnity insurance based on expertise when this is primarily on experience rather than formal qualification? That's a brilliant question. That's, that's to you, Jeff. <laughs> um, well, the, the insurance that our company had was uh, Contractors All Risk, which covered um, virtually everything that um, a contractor needs to 
cover. So that's third party employees liability uh, and so forth. And an element of that was product liability. Um, and that means if you're in effect designing a product, maybe um, a new component or a series of components in a historic structure and so forth, there's a design element in there. And so that uh, the, the design element was covered under the product liability. Uh, and also I did extend it when I became a, uh, more and more a consultant, I extended the company's uh, insurance to include a freestanding PII element. And it wasn't that expensive because they knew that we were in business and had been for a long time. So it worked fairly well. Okay. Have you anything to add, Reese, or should I just, I've got two more questions. Uh, it's, I mean, I, no, it's okay, that's fine. Okay, so this is second to last question. James, how much of a problem is there with architects acting beyond their true knowledge or ability? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we know who that was directed to. Uh, to. To be honest with you, I, I, I think it's very common. I mean, I, I you know, um, if you can imagine the, if you imagine the complexity of a building, you know, it can be hundreds, if not thousands, of decisions that you're having to make. And we're trained to design. We're trained to think about things. We're trained in certain materials, but you know, and there is a lot of um, the whole design process is 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 not only based on knowledge and fact, but sometimes you're having to push beyond what is perhaps your comfort zone to do things that are slightly unusual. And that's actually how you evolve as a designer because you're going to unknown territory. Now that can come over as being incredibly arrogant, but it's also that's how you get creative. Um, but in terms of actually knowledge and ability, um, in terms of materials, I think there should really be no excuse for that because you know you. But I, I, I've seen it happen, and I obviously I'm not. You know, architects are the same as everybody else. You know, they have architects who, who believe they know everything, and um, will insist on telling you that they know everything, even though they, they don't. Um, so i you know i just <laughs> grin and bear it james i'm afraid um but um if it's a good architect you know i think good architects uh, to be fair all, all architects are wanting to learn you know they're all wanting to develop they're the same as well maybe jeff says no but maybe it's <laughs> not. But, but you know we're always i mean i i am my my cpd is often going and spending the day on a with a skill set that I've never done before. So I may go flint napping or whatever. And I know that a lot of architects do similar things, but um, but it is, you know, there, there is obviously, it's huge because our subject is vast. I mean, of course, blacksmiths, can, even if you think about metalwork, it's just that's a vast area in its own right. And, you know, you won't get blacksmiths who so just can do everything. You'll get blacksmiths who are very niche. And I think you'll, and so they, you know, You'll find the same with architects. It's a very, very broad spectrum, so you can't expect them to know everything, even though they may sometimes behave as they do. Rhys, you're a very good conservation uh, architect. The problem I've had is with new build architects who are trying to do conservation work. And being architects, by definition, they're deemed to know all about everything, which realistically they can't. Uh, and feel, frankly, I think, rather insecure and don't want to listen to the advice of contractors because they're afraid they're going to be found wanting and I've sympathized with them and uh, if they won't listen to advice then it's an insoluble problem as far as I'm concerned. I think that's true I think there's also the issue that we went back to initially is that you know we are you know the modern generation of architects not all of them of course but uh, they are basically product-led you know they so they are used to choosing stuff and not to talk so it's about people not about people it's about the products and the reality is with that is that suddenly they believe they understand what they're talking about because they looked at a i don't know a catalog with cast iron finials in it and that's what all they believe is exist in existence is those patterns which just happen to fit in a you know they don't understand the processes involved no. uh, i mean you know we're all sort of all have that in every walk of life but um i guess that um I would agree with you that actually it's a particular problem with people. Are, I mean, I get very, very frustrated with architects who say they're conservation architects and they, they have not got a clue. And I know it's equally frustrating for, for us. You know, they're just thinking, well, you know nothing about material sciences. You know nothing about, you know, the actual issues of 
how to do this and the physical realities of this. You just believe you can draw it and therefore it's doable and that's not the same thing. Okay, thank you. Um, right, I'm going to move on to a, another question now. Um, again, this one's from Shona, Shona Johnson. Besides feeling bitter when a job we have unsuccessfully tendered for is completed in a substandard fashion and not to the tender specification. Is there anything we as craftsmen can do to mitigate this happening in the future? Apart from open discussion and education, which we do with every tender, we have had several experiences of this. Yeah. But there isn't anything else you can do. You're doing the right things there, Shona. You just have to stick with it and try and uh, spot the problem, the, the jobs where that's liable to happen. In other words, find out what the criteria for acceptance in the tendering process are and fulfill those criteria uh, and be ruthless and walk away at an early stage if you think you're going to have your time wasted. I'm sorry about it. It's a fact of life. Okay. Well, it's, I mean, in theory, you know, if something's not being done to specification, it's condemnable. So, I mean, I'm a bit surprised the architects aren't condemning it because, you know, if you tended something, designed something, and you, you that's what was being priced, and then the contractor produces something completely different. It's like going to a you know, restaurant and ordering fish and chips and ending up with a beef stew. You know, it's not the same thing. You send it back, say, I want the, beef, I want the fish and chips. I mean, I'm surprised. Yeah. I mean, that shouldn't be happening, really, but I'm, I'm sure it does. But it, it, I, I've let, let, a lot of stuff which isn't what it says on the tin, because of what I've, it's, you know. Now, let me give you an example of the problem, Rhys. The specification says uh, you must use recycled raw iron in the repair of this structure, and you price for that, and the material is more expensive than mild steel. You subsequently find the job has been done in mild steel, the paint's on it, nobody knows it's any different. And what's more, the architect or the quantity surveyor didn't know the difference and so wasn't able to reject it. Yeah, I take that point. I mean, I think that's probably very fair. And that probably is one of the primary things that does happen, isn't it? That, you know, I think another thing that happens is you get a drawing. It's just a, an AutoCAD drawing, you know, it's just an elevation. But in the spec, it says traditionally made. We know as blacksmiths what traditionally made is. You know, Reese, because I know you know ironwork very well. But what actually happens is when it's made, you know, two years down the line, you walk past it and it's all been, um, you know, fabricated, welded together. And there's no traditional construction well, or craftsmanship or a blacksmith that's touched it. It's a welder's tradition, isn't it, to do it with well, well <laughs> joints, you know. Yeah, that's, um, you, you're right. I mean, clarity of communication is really important. And one of the things, so, I mean, we, we've had this problem on lots of jobs. And so one of the ways that we try to deal with this and flush, flush it out if like, is by asking for, as part of the tender process, you can actually ask for exemplars and actually allow a sum of money in the tender process, which we've done before. We did a, a job for, for Network Rail where we actually said, actually, all of the tenderers uh, have to supply a sample of one linear meter of railing or whatever it to be and you will be paid you know x pounds each for this and you have to make sure so that we we pre-warned the the, the the network rail that's what we were doing um and they said well that's great because that enables us to test them see whether they're struck strong enough um so it was a win-win for them and then they actually saw the product and it was quite interesting how variable the actual result was you instantly could tell then no 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 you're not doing it traditionally whereas people who were doing it actually traditionally were um you know obviously ones who won in the end but um so you're you're giving uh, an example of how you can approach it if you absolutely know as the person putting the work out to tender that you want craftsmanship and it's a way of checking it as you go along with yeah, the selection process I'm, I'm, but it's no good if someone's just going to ignore the tender is it no, I mean, that's that's the products versus people thing, because at the end of the day, what I'm trying to do through the, through the tendering process is actually get to the people doing the work. So, you know, is that's what makes a difference. And then you've got an exemplar, so you can actually say, well, that's actually how we want it to be. So if you was doing stonework pointing or something like that, you do, you do this all the time, you know, uh, or have a sample panel of stonework or whatever, or brickwork, or whatever. So you'd actually set up an exemplar, but that has to be priced into the tent process. And sometimes you can do that, as I say, you know, if it's a big project, you can actually ask for a sample. 
so long as the contractor is not providing you with a free sample because obviously you know they'll end up sort of you know wasting a lot of time and effort they have to be okay. paid for that sample and, and that has to be built into the process okay that sounds good now i'm going to take a judgment here there is literally two i did get the number wrong late, uh, earlier there are literally two more questions now if we can answer them quickly if you can find a quick answer to these um one is there's a, um both um asked in advance one is from kate and it says even with the opportunity to carry out a full survey in advance of tendering, the reality is that some problems only become apparent once work commences, particularly the removal of paint and corrosion so that you can actually see what's going on. How do you provide for these types of issues during the tender stage? If it's a really complex project, would you ever seek to agree a limited scope of works with the option to agree further work once full investigation has been possible, do you put contingencies in place? Okay, so, I can ask that question first of all, because that's very pertinent to good specification writing. So you can do, you know, you, there are two ways, you know, if I'm an architect working on a job and I just think, oh, I just really can't assess that, what I will actually do is have an enabling contract where we just maybe have, you know, two days worth of investigation, pay somebody some time to actually find out what the problems actually are. So take off the paint, or etc., on a sample area, and that would really, really help. The other way of doing it, of course, is actually building into the specification provisional sums. So sums of money which are there for unforeseen issues, which you know you're going to get. I mean, the, the thing is, working in historic buildings, the one thing you can guarantee is you don't know what you're dealing with. And actually, how to deal with that is, as, a, as, a, as an architect, is through the tendering process, you should actually be building fat into your pricing documents and we will often do that we'll, so we'll say for example it may be say casting you may say have a pattern you know make a pattern da -da -da -da, allow for remaking the pattern you know whatever happens to be so you allow you do allow you should be allowing uh, don't know if there are any specifiers out there but that one of the things you need to be doing if there are is actually factoring in in fact you're not going to get it right first time and you're not going to find out what the actual issues are first time so you're just going to build it into the tender documents Okay, that sounds sound. Uh, sound. Uh, Jeff, do you have anything to quickly yeah, add? I think um, when you're, what I've always been trying to develop in the tendering process is a credible submission, uh, a viable to make up a viable contract. And I think it's my responsibility as a specialist, as a contractor, to try and make the contract viable for everybody's point of view. So if I know that uh, there might be corroded fastenings I can't see, or cracked under paint, or all sorts of other things. I try and list them out and say, we don't actually know uh, about this, this and this. Uh, and we have made the following assumptions. I may have included for something, I may have excluded whatever, I may have allowed for replacing 10% of the fastenings, whatever. So I say that and then uh, say the client sh should consider making allowance for arisings during the contract. In other words, put the responsibility for um, this back on the client or the, the specifier so that you don't end up being deemed to have known that they should have that, that you should have allowed for these sort of things during your, uh, your tender yeah that's turned to the same stick isn't it so you know you're doing what i'm doing but from your so if you if there's a deficit in this in the specification in the schedule then it's on the onus is on the contractor to, to do that but actually you know equally the onus is on me to make sure that those things are actually factored in as well so between the both of us, we should end up with a pretty good understanding. Because, you know, the reality is there's no point in pulling the wool over anybody's eyes because as soon as you do the work, it becomes apparent what the issues are and you have to face them and you have to pay for them. So it's better off flushing it out sort of early doors. The problem is that if you're deemed to have qualified the tender, and so we've always said we are going to clarify the tender, not qualify it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Right, I'm taking the chance by asking this one last question. So again, if we could um, come up with, get to the point quickly, that'd be good. By Dave Gent, I have delivered what I know are technically strong tenders just to be pipped at the post by a cheaper alternative. So what is tendering there for? To achieve the cheapest or the best? If it is in fact the cheapest, which most quantity surveyors would agree it is for, then where does quality fit in? Uh, I completely and utterly agree. I think, you know, it's not a, it shouldn't be about 
you know, it should be about value for money. Your primary objective is always quality. And that's what we tell every client. That that's what it should be. But I can completely understand that there are cases where um, uh, money, especially if you've got a QS, um, doesn't understand. You know, the 90% of a job is usually very easy to, 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 to quantify. And actually, um, that's actually a very predictable thing. It's that last 10% where the quality really shines out, which is really difficult to price. And that's probably what he's doing. He's actually saying that this last 10% is really, really good. And it'll make a big difference. But that's very difficult to see to attend the document. Um, well, that's very uh, nicely brings us to the title of this webinar, doesn't it? Is it up to quality or down to a price? And from a contractor's point of view, I think it's essential to find out before you get tendering what the criteria for acceptance are and then try and comply with them or walk away from them if you can't accept them. So that's when you find out what you, you uh, pointed out earlier on to an earlier question is whether it was literally just down to price. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, right. tendering is usually just down to price. So it's, I mean, that's, and it's, that's, that's what QSs will say it is because that's, you know, they tend to run it. But, you know, but, you know we, you, we've got to be careful that it's actually not just about price. It is always about quality as well. That's the real key thing as far as I'm concerned. It's quality lasts. The price you won't notice in two weeks' time. You know, but if it's a bad quality, you'll notice it forever. Okay, right. Well, I think that's a probably a very good uh, place to sum up now. Uh, we are over time, about 20 minutes. But um, to close, is there one last thing, you know, to both of you uh, that you'd like to say as a closing remark? So if you could suggest one thing as a positive for people to take away from this discussion today, what would it be? Jeff, would you like to go first? Um, being a contractor, I'm going to try and get really good value for money here and ask for two. Uh, the first is join NHIG and certainly come along to the next um, webinar or the series of CPDs that we're hoping to develop on this subject because it's a good way of learning. Uh, the second is, um, it, even if you're a very good craftsman, um, a great practitioner, you have to think like a businessman and you have to, when you're tendering, you've not got to just think about how uh, the work is going to get done and the craftsmanship and all that sort of stuff. You've got to look at the contract <laughs> and think in hard commercial terms, like a businessman or woman. That's all. Thank you. Maurice? I would say you just, um, it's important that the head and the hand work together. So, um, because the hand is useless without the head and the head is useless without the hand. So and that means basically talk to people. Um, and, you know, the, the real, my real successes have sort of come down to speaking to people on site who said, well, why don't we do it like this? And I think, oh, of course, that's so obvious. I didn't, didn't see it like that. It's, it's using two brains or three brains or four brains or five brains and 16 pairs of hands. That's what gets the job done properly. That's in encouraging dialogue, which is what we've been talking about earlier on. Brilliant. Thank you. Right. Well, um, thank you um, for everyone who's actually listened tonight, but particularly a huge thank you to those who've taken part. So to Reese, Jeff and Sarah earlier. However, I'd also like to say thank you to those behind the scenes who haven't seen. So there's uh, doing the admin here for tonight, which was Nicola Emerson and Johanna Thunberg. Uh, another particular huge thanks to Icon, especially um, Sarah and Nicola for making, to, you know, their support is what has made tonight's um, event possible. If you happen to be interested in our next one, where we uh, continue the Conversation Builds Understanding series, then it's on the 2nd of December at 7 p.m. And the topic is widening out uh, tendering up to the full procurement process about how do you ensure craftsmanship? So details are on the NHIG website and we'll have conservation architect, James Sibson of Field and Clegg Bradley Studios and the ironwork conservator, David James of George James and Sons Blacksmiths. Um, just a couple of last things. Um, if you want to be on the mailing list to receive the information of uh, future events, and please sign up to the NHIG newsletter on the Join and Support Us page of the website. Uh, but even better, if you want to support events like this and enable the NHIG to continue to provide them, then please do sign up as for membership because uh, we do not have core funding and this is a means of us doing our work, how we fund it. 
Um, but thank you. Uh, that's it. So thanks to everyone for taking my. I'd like to say goodbye. I'm sure our panelists would like to say goodbye to everyone too. Thank you. And All thank right. you. Thanks, Sally. Thanks for watching. Thanks. Yes, very much. Thanks for watching.